We're going to turn our attention to God's Word here for a little bit this morning. Uh, we are in the fourth and final uh, installment of our series entitled Get Real. Amen. Get Real. We started a couple weeks ago uh, being authentic in an artificial world. And so we've spent the last several weeks talking about the different areas where we need to get real in our lives. Amen? Amen. And the whole reason we've done this series uh, is because I believe that where you walk in the light, you experience God's light. Isn't that right? Wherever you're walking in the light, that's where you experience God's light. And so it is incumbent upon us to bring every area of our life into his light so as his light shines upon it and transforms it, his light can fill that area of our life. Isn't that right? We want his light to fill our emotional life. We want his life to fill our relationships. We want his life to fill our finances and our, and our sense of destiny. We want God's life to fill every part of our life. And in order for that to happen, we've got to bring it to the light. Somebody say, bring it to the light. Bring it to the light. Amen. So we've been looking at that reality over the past several weeks. And so if you would turn with me to our passage one more time in 1 John, uh, not the Gospel of John, but the first letter, or the first epistle of John, John chapter 1, and verse number 5, we've been in this text for the last several weeks, and we are going there one more time, uh, and in looking at this passage, we recognize the fact that John describes the importance of, of us bringing our lives into the light by giving us uh, three different cycles of uh, that focus on bringing different areas of our life into the light of God. We said that in each cycle, there is a claim that is made, there is a consequence to that claim that is described, and then there is a cure given for that claim, those claims being false claims. I remember us talking about that. And so we see that in 1 John chapter 5, and verse 9. And one of the things you may or may not have noticed, but in each cycle that he gives us, there is an increasing severity. There is an increasing seriousness to the importance of us bringing that area into the light of God. Yes. Into the light of God. So uh, the anchor to all of this is there in verse number 5, which says, This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, namely, that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. And so as we seek to walk in the light and to get real and not live in the shadows and in the corners of darkness in our lives, the only thing that anchors us, gives us the courage to do that, is to remember that God is the one in himself who is light first. Amen? Yes. Come on. Honestly, openness doesn't start with you. Right. Amen. It starts with God. He is the one who in his nature is true. He is the one in his nature that is holiness. And as we pursue that in our own lives, we have to anchor it to the conviction that we are pursuing a God of truth. Amen. That he lives in light. In him there is no darkness at all. And so then in verse number 6, we see the first cycle that John gives us that describes what area we are supposed to be walking in the light in. Each of those cycles begins with the, the words, if we claim. Yes. If we claim. And so we see that in verse 6, and we see that in verse 8, and then last we see in verse 10. In verse number 6 it says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, what's the result? We have fellowship with one another. Say one another. We have fellowship, we have communion with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So the first area that we want to walk in the light in, the first area that we want to get real in, is in our relationship with one another. Praise God. And not be front with one another. Not trying to act like everything's okay, but it's not. Amen. Not pretending to be something that we're not. But if we're going to walk in the light and experience life in our relationships with each other, we've got to begin to walk in the light with each other. Amen? Amen. So he describes that in verse number 6. 6 and 7. And then he moves on. And he says in verse 8, If we claim to be without sin, there it is again, if we claim, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Verse number 8 says, in this case, if we claim to be without sin, who are we deceiving? Ourselves. Ourselves. 
<laughs> John says that part of truth living is walking in the light with yourself. Right? Not fooling yourself about your true condition, about the real state of your heart and the sins that you're dealing with. And so he says that there is a aspect that we have to walk in the light with ourselves and get real with ourselves. And in verse 10, which is the verse that we're just going to look at for a few minutes here this morning, verse 10 he says the final cycle if we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in us. So you see that John gets more and more serious with this idea of getting real and walking in the light. In the first instance, we're, dis we're trying to deceive others. And the result of that is you're, you're being hypocritical. Right? If you don't deal with it. And then in, in the next stage, we're trying to deceive ourselves. Which is not being hypocritical, it's being delusional. Saying something about yourself that, come on, even you know is not true. And you have to convince yourself it's true. Oh, I don't really have a problem with that. Really? I'm better than I really than people think I am, right? That might be other people, but it's not me in need of grace, right? That's delusional. But in verse number 10, he moves to the final warning, the final stage. He's not dealing with being hypocritical. He's not dealing with being delusional. He's dealing with being blasphemous. Come on, when you move from saying, I'm without saying to other people, and you move beyond saying that to yourself, and you say, as it says here in verse 10, you begin to say to God, I have no sin. He said, you are a liar, and the verse says, we make him out to be a liar. We make him out to be a liar. I don't know about you, but that's the last thing I want to do is try to live in a way or think in a way that makes God a liar and make me true. Oh, no. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, I know in church that sounds like something that's outrageous that we would never do. But in those areas of our lives where we think we know better than God, that we know the path that is right, we know the path that leads to life, we know, think that we know what's going to satisfy us, and we disregard God's truth and God's law because we know better. We've actually taken God off of his position as the righteous and true holy God and say, God, I know better than you. You're not telling the truth. Come on. Kind of ironic that at the same moment that we say that we are not, that we are without sin, in that moment, we're sinning. Think about that. You're saying, when you say that, it, it's sort of like uh, when the most humble person in the room, please raise your hand. Right? Because if you truly have a sense of humility and recognition of your position before God, the last thing a humble person is going to do is say, I'm more humble than you. Right? Let me get a little closer to home. It's kind of like a person who says, I eat healthy. As they have a triple stack cheeseburger with bacon on it, smothered in barbecue sauce between their lips. <laughs> By your very actions, come on, somebody, you are betraying what you just said, isn't it right? <laughs> and in the same way, he's saying, if we're saying we are people that don't have sin, in saying that, you're sinning. <laughs> and so let's get honest in our relationship with God because it's important for us to be in our in honest in our relationship. With God because he's the one that we are going to stand before someday. So it does no good to try and put on airs and put on fronts and put on religious uh, performance and religious costumes because one day we're going to have to stand before him. And after all, he's the one that we want a deeper relationship with, right? Come on, if it's good for our relationship to get real with one another, it's good for my emotional and well-being to get real with myself, it's certainly good for my relationship with God to get real with him. Amen. So it's important, even though it's in modern times, one of the hardest things to do is to admit that we are sinners. Come on, the scripture says, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. That word none means nobody. Amen. Not me, not you, not Billy Graham, not your grandmama, nobody. Is righteous in and of ourselves. We've all fallen short. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. For all have sinned 
and fallen short of the glory of God. Come on. So when we recognize that we have committed deeds and acts of sinfulness, you're just like everybody else. Right? We're just like everybody else. And though our sins may be great, how I many you know we have a great Savior? Yes. Come on. If we, are, if we are great sinners, we have a greater Savior. Amen. Praise God. Come on, we say it tonight. Our God is greater. Amen. We say it this morning. Our God is greater than our sin. He's greater than our shortcomings. He's greater than what we inherited from our bringing. He is greater than those the propensities in our life. And so we don't have to run from them in order to overcome them. And from, in fact, we stand and we are honest with God about them. Yes, Lord, I am a great sinner, but you are a greater Savior. Hallelujah. And one of the things I love about this passage that's talking about uh, deception and it's talking about coming out of darkness and it's talk talking about confessing our sin. If you go back and you read chapter 1 of John, there's a couple words that don't seem to fit. Those words are the words Father. Father. The words Father appear in there. Praise God. Father. We have fellowship. Our fellowship is with the Father. And with his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. There in, in verse number four, it's with the Father. Amen. Appears here another, a second time in the passage. There's another word that doesn't seem to fit, not just the word Father, but the word fellowship. Fellowship. Why is that important, my Savior? It's because when we talk about confessing our sins, it's not because God is interested in us entering into a state of legal rightness, like a judge. But as a father, he is interested in entering into a loving relationship with us. There's a difference. There's a difference between legal rightness from the perspective of a judge and loving relationship from the perspective of a father who wants us to know him and, and love him and have fellowship with him. That's why it's important for us to get real with him. And every belief, so even though it is very hard for us to do as uh, fallen human beings, acknowledging our sins before God also has some evil and is quick and is eager to confess our sins before God and admit them before God. I can share one of the good, encouraging things about that. The first thing is that God is looking for you. Come on. If you are somebody who is ready and willing to confess your faults and confess your sins and not excuse them, not deny them, not blame them, God is looking for you. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 5 and verse 31, if you want to turn to it. Luke chapter 5. Amen. The third, the third gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Amen. Chapter number 5 and verse 31. As the Pharisees were confronting Jesus about his association, the association of his disciples with sinners, Jesus answered them, the scripture says, that it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but who? The sick. It's the sick. And Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call who? Sinners. sinners. Those who know that there's a problem, that know that things are not right, know that there are areas where they displease God. Those are the ones that I have come for, Jesus. All of you that are quote unquote righteous, all of you that are quote unquote healthy, I didn't come for you. Listen, I can't do anything with you. But those of you that have contrition, those of you that are broken, those that are upset with the sin and the brokenness in your life, Jesus says, You're the one I'm looking for. I'm looking for you. Amen. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That which was lost. Amen. God is looking for us when we're someone who is ready to acknowledge our sinfulness. And when I say that God is looking for you, come on, the first example that comes to my mind is goes all the way back to the first pair in Genesis chapter 3. Do you remember that? In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 19. Come on. After they had sinned, after they had bitten on the apple and they had disobeyed God and they had entered into a condition not just actions, but a state, a condition of sinfulness. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, it says that the Lord God called the man and he said, where are you? And we all understand that when God asked, where are you? He was not asking about his location. He knew where he was. It says he was calling him because he wanted to bring him back into relationship. 
relationship. He could have at that very moment said, Adam, Eve, I'm done with you. You broke my law. I'm never going to speak to you again. We're, we're finished. But he said, no, I am coming looking for you in the garden. Why? Because I want to restore what your sin has broken. Oh, thank God. That is who we are. God is. He is a God who looks for us when we have broken his law. He looks for us when we have sinned against him. Hallelujah. He comes looking for you. He told the, world, the blind guides, the blind guides, the Pharisees, chapter 9 of John, chapter 40, after giving them a discussion of spiritual blind, blindness, Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Come on, can I just say, it's okay for us as believers to acknowledge our sinfulness before God. Sometimes we're so concerned with putting on an air of having arrived, of having achieved, come on, of having our lives all cleaned up. We clean up come off the big sins that everybody can see on the outside. But we don't deal with some of those sins of anger, some of those sins of jealousy, some of those sins of lust, those things that are going on on the inside that nobody sees. And we think that we've got to keep all that under wraps. But God is saying part of being a real believer is you bring those things into the light. Right. You get real with him about them, first and foremost. Yeah. Amen. And God says he's looking for you. Do you remember as a little kid or maybe as, as a parent, uh, I remember in our home playing high go seat with our kids in our apartment. I remember that. <laughs> and our house, our apartment was pretty good size, especially for two or three year olds. <laughs> And so we would play hide and seek in the house, and we would let them go hide anywhere in the house that they wanted to go, anywhere in the closet or behind the drapes or, or you know, maybe in the, in the kitchen somewhere. We let them go hide wherever they wanted to go. And when they did that, we would act like we couldn't find them. Come on, every good parent acts like they can't find their child when so they play hide and seek. Right? And we would look around the house, and we did not find them quick enough. We didn't find them in the time frame that our kids thought we ought to find them. They used to say something like this. Bet you can't find me. <laughs> they would give themselves away in order that, what? We would find them, right? <laughs> because they didn't want to be hiding too long. They wanted to be found. Can I just tell you? When we begin to confess our sins and our shortcomings and our failures to God, yeah. you know what that's like doing before God? Come find me. Yes, Lord. Come find me. Yes. Come rescue me. Because yes. I recognize I don't have what it takes to deal with this. Come help me. Come help me. And John is telling us if we are going to be the type of people who are real with others and real with ourselves, it begins with getting real with God, and that means bringing our sins to Him. Amen. Amen. God is looking for you Amen. if you're that kind of person. Amen. There's another thing that I think about when I think about us getting real with God. Not only if our word doesn't encourage us to know that God is looking for you if that's the kind of person you are. Another thing that I think is true is that God is in love with you. God is in love with you. Well, come on, Pastor, slow down just a minute. Just a minute. Now, now, I use those terms in love with you. Because when we say God loves you, that passes past our ears and over our heart, and that means nothing to us because we hear it so much. We take it for granted. And when I say that God is in love with you, I'm not saying it in the sense that God has a fickle, emotional kind of feeling towards you that rises and falls, and, and sometimes he loves you, and sometimes he doesn't. He doesn't have a heavenly uh, flower up there where he says, I love you, I don't love you, I love you, I don't love you. He's not saying that. It is a settled love. It is a settled affection for you. It is a commitment to what is in your best interest in spite of you working against your own best interest. Amen. Amen. And so in that sense, God is in love with you. Now, that is not because of our own goodness. It's not because we've earned it by our church attendance or by how much we've given the offering or how long we've served him. We have to understand something about the love of God. 
the several different aspects to God's love or depths of God's love. Theologians talk about God's, God's love of benevolence. Benevolence. It has to do with the attitude of goodwill that God has towards every human person that he's created. Come on, sinner or saint, amen. He has a love of benevolence. It kind of refers to that in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, in the, in the Christmas narrative, when the, when the a choir of angels is making the announcement of Jesus' birth, and they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, goodwill toward what? All men. Listen, God has goodwill. He has an attitude of goodness and, and, and uh, benevolence to every creature that he has created. Yes, God. Amen. Bless his name. Amen. And so there is the aspect of God's love that is benevolent, or it is a part of his goodwill. Theologians talk about another stage of God's love, and that is not only the, the love of God from a benevolent standpoint, but it is God's love of beneficence. Beneficence, not benevolence, but beneficence. What does that mean? It's not only does he have a good attitude towards us, he acts in good ways towards us. Amen. Come on, again, that is sinner and saint. Amen. You know the scripture that applies to that? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and what? The, the good. good. He sends his rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And by the way, that takes place in the context of Jesus' discussion of the Sermon on the Mount where he tells us to love our enemies. Amen. Amen. Don't just love those who love you back. Don't just love those that are easy for you to get along with. He says, love them, yeah, but love your enemies. Love them all. And the example of that is God who is beneficent. He is a God who loves everyone that he's created in attitude and he demonstrates it by doing good things towards them. Amen. But when we talk about, when we talk about God is in love with us as those who confess our sins before God, we acknowledge our shortcomings. We don't hide them. We don't excuse them. We don't run from them. When we talk about God loving us in that context, we're not talking about his general benevolent love. We're not talking about his general beneficent love that is true for all humanity. We are talking about the God's love that he has for believers. Believers in Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love. Somebody say own love. His own love. His unique love. His love that is unlike the love that we experience on a human level. He demonstrated that love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still messed up, Christ died for us. While we were still running from him, he died for us. When we were still hiding in the shadows and living in darkness, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for you to clean up. He didn't wait for you to come to him. He didn't wait for you to be a better person. He died for you and I while we were still enemies, sinners, hostile men. Only God has that kind of love. Only God has that kind of love. Hallelujah. And in that sense, God is in love with you. When you are a person who confesses and acknowledges your sin before him, God says, I love that person. I love that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and following, it says, in love, he predestinated us. He predestined us to be adopted as his son. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that's music to my ears all the way. I love it. It sounds a lot of pages turning. Amen. I can't hear the sound of Bible apps scrolling, so I'll just trust that's happening. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, the latter part, it says, In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Don't miss that in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Yeah. Praise God. I like the way the King James still says that verse 6, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me try and reconcile this. There is a sense in which God, because of his infinite holiness and righteousness, cannot look on sin with approval. It offends him. Hallelujah. Come on. That's a problem for us 
who are sinners. That means in our natural state, in our natural condition, no matter how nice we try to be, no matter what religious performances we try to perform, no matter what humanitarian efforts that we may make to make an impact on the world, in and of ourselves, we are enemies to God. He is angry with not just our sin, but with us as the sinners. I like the way the theologians say that. There's this discussion that God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And somebody said he doesn't send sin to hell. Catch that? He doesn't send sin to hell. He sends sinners to hell. So let's not get twisted. In and of ourselves, we were offensive to God. But yet, he is a God of great love that overcomes that offense. Come on. He overcomes that enmity that our sins have created. And he finds a way to love us, not just to love us, but to love us in the same manner he loves his son, Jesus Christ. How can I say that? Because we are accepted in the blood. We are accepted in the blood. Amen. We are accepted as he's, if there's ever a perfect Focus a perfect receptor of God's love. It is his son, Jesus Christ. And when I get up under him in relationship with him, by uniting with him, God says, I love you just like I love my son. Oh, you didn't hear that. You didn't hear that. There's not God loves Jesus and God loves you. There is God loves Jesus and God loves you in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. There's security in that. There is comfort in that. Listen, there is courage in that. I can bring my brokenness. I can bring my mistakes. You know, sometimes we cannot own up to our mistakes and our sins before people because they don't have that same kind of love for us. Okay. Well, come on. But we can always bring them before God because he always loves us in the manner that he loves his son, Jesus Christ. God is in love with you in that sense. Praise God. And if we're going to get real, we have to be convinced of that. We have to have the conviction that there's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that I can say that what Paul says separates me from the love of Christ. Amen. The love of God that is in Christ, our Lord. Amen. Yes. Let's get real with God because God is in love with you. Yeah. Let me give you one more. One more. Praise God. Not only is God looking for you, and God is in love with you, but if you are someone that is eager and quick to bring your sins before God and confess them before him, God is liberating you. God is liberating you. Later on in the same letter of 1 John, that our text is found in chapter 3 and verse 7. John chapter, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. John writes, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And he who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. I don't know about you, but when we, if we just stop right there, that gives us a little bit of an angst. Because we recognize we're not always the ones that do righteous. Sometimes we fall in that category where we don't do righteous. And John draws a pretty strong line here. And he says, if you do righteous, then you're righteous, as he is righteous. But if you do evil, if you do sin, then you're like your father who sins. The devil. So that can make us a little bit nervous. But then he goes on and he says, in verse 8, that the reason the Son of God appeared, the reason he showed up in the flesh was to destroy the devil's work. He showed up to destroy the devil's work. So that, verse 9, no one who was born of God will continue to sin. Why? Because God's seed that overcomes sin remains in him. He cannot go on sinning. Why? Because he has been born of God. And the Son of God has come to destroy the works of the enemy. Why is that good news? Because even those times when I stumble and I fall, and I don't act the way I'm supposed to act, I don't think the way I'm supposed to think, I don't say what I'm supposed to say, I don't look the way I'm supposed to look, 
that says to us we need to be careful. We need to be careful about consigning people to a devil's hand and saying they're not really a Christian, they're not really a believer. Look at the way they act. Look at what they do. Look at where they go. Look at what they've said. Come on. They may be down. They may be in the gutter, skinned up, knees, face down. But if God's seed is in them, he is going to restore them. He is going to lift them. He's going to bring them out of that. And they may be in a temporary moment of fall and sin, just like you and I at moments don't look our best. Amen. Amen. He doesn't say that a believer can never sin. It says that we do not continue in the lifestyle of sin. Because his spirit is always pulling us up. His seed is always pulling us out of that. Yeah. Come on, the best picture I have of that is when you go out, it's when I used to go out fishing. When I from Colorado, used to go out to Estes Park and go fishing. Sometimes we've been out there fishing. On the end of that fishing line, Pop made remember when we put that, that line out there trying to catch rainbow trout. This, I, this, I, I didn't necessarily even like to eat trout. I just love the hunt catch them. <laughs> and we would throw that, that line out there, and I'd get patient and patient. I said, I want to pull it up. And I said, wait, 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 keep throwing it out there. You're never gonna, you're never gonna catch anything. And so he put those little red and white bobbers out there on the end of that line so that when that bobber went down, then we knew we had a fish, right? One of the things about those little red bobbers, if a wave came and covered up that bobber and it went underwater for a moment, it wasn't but a few seconds later before that bobber came bobbing right back up to the top. Right? Because there was something in that bobber that kept it from staying under the water. Can I tell you, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you might go down on one day you might have a few series of setbacks in one season of your life, but because God's Spirit is living in you, because His DNA is in your soul, you are going to come back up to the surface. You're going to come back to the surface, and you will not remain under the weight of that sin. Amen. I don't know about you, that's good news to me. That's good news. That's worth celebrating. That even when I feel like I failed, God is still at work liberating us. Praise God. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, he took the scroll containing the prophet Isaiah's reading, and it says, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, yes. to release those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. Oh, yeah. He has come to free us. He has come to give us sight. He has come to liberate us. And no matter how weak we might feel, how enslaved we might be, we have a greater liberator. Is that right? Yes. Amen. Amen. Let me do this. The Prussian, the Prussian king, Frederick the Great, was once touring a prison in Berlin. And as he toured the prison, it said that all the prisoners bowed on their knee, they got low, and they began to cry out to him about their innocence in hopes that he would release them from their captivity. And so each prisoner that he came to had that same response, pleading their case, declaring why they should be released, why they were innocent. And as he walked through that crowd of prisoners, there was one prisoner that remained silent said not a word. So Frederick the Great stopped and he asked that prisoner the question. He said, are you guilty? Are you guilty? He said, yes, your majesty. I am guilty. I deserve my punishment. What did you do? Armed robbery, your majesty. Frederick then summoned the jailer and he said, at once I want you to release this guilty prisoner so that he does not corrupt all of these other innocent folks. <laughs> what does that say to us? When we 
have sinned, when we have shown up, when we have failure, rather than running from God, rather than trying to cover it up, justify it, blame, bring it to God. Yes, Lord. Get real with God. Be honest with God about that. And in that process of Him setting you and I free begins. I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in coming to church and being bound Monday through Saturday. I want to come to church rejoicing because I've been free and continually being freed from more and more areas of my life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you for all my friends that have gathered here. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness. We thank you, Lord, for your incredible, benevolent, beneficent, love towards us. But most of all, we thank you for the love that is perfect towards us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I just ask this, this morning, if there be any among us this morning that are seeking your favor, that are seeking relationship with you on the basis of our own credentials, on the basis of our own morality, God, that you would help us to abandon our confidence in our own goodness and cling solely to the perfect righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, let that be our experience. Just with every head down, every eye closed, as believers are praying this morning, I just want to offer the invitation to those of us in the sanctuary and those that are watching online. If you have never entered into a relationship with God that is not based upon your own goodness and your own morality, the Bible says that our sins, our, our righteousness, Sorry, is like filthy rags. And so we need to be covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. If you're here this morning, just by an upraised hand and say, Pastor, I want to make sure that things are right between me and God, that I'm not standing, attempting to have a relationship with God in my own effort, but I'm standing in the righteousness of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The ones here to embarrass you, just want to give you an opportunity to enter into the light. Even for those that are watching online this morning, right where you're viewing, maybe in your car, maybe while you're outside on the patio, wherever you are, you can receive Christ into your life right where you are. I'm going to lead us into a simple prayer. If you're here in the sanctuary or even if you're just watching online, and you say, I need to have that righteous relationship with God based upon me goodness and perfection of Jesus and not my own goodness. I want to invite you to pray with you. I just encourage all of the Grace family just to pray with us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning and I acknowledge my sin. I'm sorry. I turn away from it. I know that it has separated me from relationship with you. That nothing I could ever do would close that gap. But Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. You paid the price for all of my sin that I might have a new relationship with God as my Father and not my church. So Jesus, come into my heart. Wash my heart clean. Give me a brand new start. And from this moment forward, help me to walk in the light. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we give the Lord a hand praise this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Listen, if you prayed that prayer this morning, and you meant that from your heart, God heard you. Amen. Amen. God heard you. The scripture says that there are angels in heaven that are rejoicing this morning because of one sinner who comes to repentance. If you prayed that prayer this morning, um, here in the sanctuary or even on the line, you guys know we have this little booklet entitled Now What? Uh, I don't know if everyone has had a chance to go through this. Um, whether you received Christ for the first time or recommitted this morning, or even if you haven't, I really want to encourage you to please see myself or, or, or 
up here and make sure you get one of these now what booklets. It has seven very short lessons that are meant to just cover the span of one week. Somebody say one week. One week, oh. one week of, of investing in your new life in Christ, giving you a little bit of information about the decision that you made when you, when you come to Christ and what it means to be born again. Gives you a scripture reading through the Gospel of John and there's some questions you can answer. And uh, we always want to make it clear that if uh, you made that step of faith and you would like to uh, get the process of lifelong discipleship, uh, the first seven days you can do that uh, with one of these books. Let us know that you would like for someone to go through that with you and we'll put you in touch in with men, women, with women, with uh, one of the members of the Brace family that will be a, a guide and a support, a partner with you in your new family. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, we want to also uh, give opportunity to worship the Lord with our giving this morning. We're, we're, we're getting closer towards uh, things being the way they were. They're not all. They're not going to be the way they were completely. I mean, you know that. We never want to get to that place. Uh, but we're we're moving forward towards at least some of the things the way that they were previously. Um, we're not quite there with our our offering plate yet. Um, but how many of you noticed we're at least getting our seating arrangement similar to what it was before? Amen. You know, we're not all separated in corners and high. You know, spread all out. We're getting a little bit closer to one another. And uh, so. We just want to uh, just remind everybody, um, you know, if you're, if you're vaccinated or, or uh, and, and you feel comfortable, you're, you're, you're not required to wear a mask if you'd like to. We certainly don't have any problem with that. We understand. Uh, but we just, we want to get past the past and move forward to what God has in the next season. Amen? Amen. So we are trying to do that. Um, but we're not quite there with the offering plate yet. So as we uh, leave the sanctuary this morning, you will find the offering plate or the offering, the offering box. Uh, towards the uh, back door right next to it. So if you brought your time and offering, uh, we would just greatly appreciate your support and, and dropping your time and offering uh, in the box as you as you dismiss. Amen? Amen. Along with any uh, praise reports or uh, pray, uh, prayer requests that you may have. I know that um, even though we are starting to come out of this pandemic, we are still uh, shaking off a lot of the uh, effects of that. And so there's still uh, a lot of things that we are praying about. It's not just physical, but uh, including that, but sometimes just the, the mental and the emotional strain of all that we, we've been through. We need to support one another and encourage one another in prayer through all those things as well. So again, prayer request. Uh, the uh, race connection cards are there on the back table, and you can drop that in the offer plate as well. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's all stand together. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Father, I thank you, Lord, for all of my friends that are, that are here this morning. And Lord, as we look forward to this upcoming week, Lord, I pray, Lord, that when we are confronted, Lord, with those areas of our, of our sinfulness, those areas, Lord God, where we fall short, Lord, rather than feeling, Lord, that uh, we cannot come to you, that we've got to uh, excuse or, or hide, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would remind us that, Lord, that acknowledging our sin before you is, is that first step. Lord, in being forgiven, in being cleansed, and, and finding freedom from those things. And, that we would uh, rejoice in the fact that we are loved, or beyond all recognition, not because of our goodness, but because of the goodness and the perfect righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just give us strength, give us grace, Lord God, and let us grow to be more like you this upcoming week. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Jesus, you know what God's people said? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thanks for being here. You are this day.